and welcome to the 10th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, electronic devices, etc. We have received a apologies from Mark MacDonald and I therefore welcome once again his substitute Bob Doris to the meeting. Welcome Bob. Uh, our second item of business today, uh, sorry, first item of business today is to decide whether to take items four and five in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business today is to take evidence as part of our post-legislative scrutiny of the Local Government Finance, Unoccupied Properties, etc. Scotland Bill's financial memorandum. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting uh, Judy Orr of Argyll and Butte Council and Brian Murison of Highland Council. Uh, members of copies have all written submissions received, along with the Scottish Parliament Information Centre briefing. So we'll go straight to questions from the committee. And uh, the normal procedure in the committee is I'll start with some opening questions and then we'll expand the session out to uh, uh, colleagues uh, round the table. So the first uh, uh, question really, um, it's just, it's not on your own submissions, although I'm going to go into your submissions. And when I ask a question, either of you or both of you can uh, feel free to, to ask, um, was with regard to... Um, speculative activity and or regeneration uh, with the exception of Falkirk uh, all local authorities responded to the evidence said they saw no evidence of an impact on speculative or regeneration activity just wonder if you want to, to, to kind of comment on that Chair, for our own council, that's our Gallen Butte Council, um, we have not found any evidence of that, um, but it has been difficult to, to track any of that directly. Um, we, we have a, a, a TIF area um, in, in our Lord, Lorne, an open area, which was just starting up, and we are expecting to have regeneration activity uh, grouped around that, but it, it, it's, it's a too early a stage to, to have any, see anything as a noticeable as an effect of the empty rates changes. Is that something you would um, agree with, basically? Yes, we have, uh, uh, we have areas that we are aware of regeneration, but there's no correlation between that and the empty properties. Uh, for that. Now, in terms of the uh, uh, Gale and Butte uh, submission, um, you've said that collection rates have been adversely uh, affected, you know. You basically said that collection accounts with double charge at the end of January was only 79% compared with overall, overall collection rates at that time of 93.66%. I'm just wondering if you can um, tell us why you think that might be the case. Um, Chair, we, we certainly find a continuing issue with collection on the accounts which have the, the double council tax charge on them. At the end of February, the, the collection rate on those particular accounts hadn't changed from that. It was still around the 80% mark, whereas our overall collections was up at the 96.5% sort of by that stage. Um, we, we, these are particular properties which have been empty for a long time. And in many cases, they, the owners or, or landlords um, are absent and, and, and not living in the locality. Uh, we, we know from the addresses that they are in particular areas where it's, it's, it is difficult. Uh, there's a surplus of property uh, there, uh, and the properties don't necessarily have a, a, re, a good resale value in the marketplace. They aren't easy to sell. Um, so it's not really a surprise to us that the collection is, is down on those particular properties. And it is a, it's affecting our overall collection rate by about 0.4 of a percent. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the cost of pursuing these individuals, um, what is the impact on the council of that? Uh, there is no direct impact on the council in terms of the cost of pursuing them. That's because we have arrangements set up with sheriff officers uh, which are commission-based, uh, and so it means that unless we make a collection on those accounts, we aren't actually paying out any money. Uh, so there's no direct impact on, on the council's financials in terms, except for the loss of the council tax income itself. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Murison, in Highlands, I don't I assume that um, the figures for 13-14 are not complete. I wonder if you could clarify that because you said that the collection rate uh, in 12-13, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, of um, you know, empty properties and second homes. You're talking about, you know, 98.92%, uh, 1213 to 52.71%. Um, which seems quite a dramatic difference. Yes. Sure. The end of February anticipated mm -hmm. was 88.21%. Okay. So you expect it to be over the, close to the. Over we, 90%? We, we're only, as I say, we have only increased it 
by the 10%. So we're only seeing a 0.1% reduction. So we would anticipate the figures to be on. We've nothing to suggest it would be anything less than what has been for previous years. Now, one of the things you did actually say in your, in your submission of some was that an emerging issue is a marginal increase in pop-up type shops, which may be attributed to landlords seeking out short-term tenants, possibly rent-free to avoid 90% EPR. Uh, I just want, uh, you know, is this something you, you expect to see increase, or is it just a, you said it was marginal, but is it something that the council's concerned about? Yes, it is. It's, it's marginal at the moment, as we're talking of maybe less than 10 properties, but they're clustered in, obviously, the high street, and, for example, in Inverness particularly, where we saw over the Christmas period a sort of influx of, sort of Christmas bazaar-type shops that have moved on to become sort of independent mobile sh trading shops. They're there for about three months, then disappear, and the same, without saying it, the same owners sort of just change the sort of type of shop or the same occupiers, and it's, we're seeing a pattern emerging. And is the way in which you feel that that matter could be addressed? What we are doing is we are um, moving on to so I use, utilising the legislation. We've written to two of the landlords in particular that own the properties, and we are suggesting that we will charge them as the leases will be under the one year. Okay. And is there Galen Butte seeing anything of that nature, Ms. Orr? Um, no, I think our economy is, is not as buoyant as uh, in Inverness, and uh, unfortunately we haven't actually had pop-up shops, we just have had empty properties, but um, I have noticed that the, the, you know, the numbers of empty properties uh, for non-domestic rates has re been reducing year on year. Um, and, and so it, it's not a, a growing problem, it's a slightly lessening problem. Okay. Just one other point before I open up uh, the, the session to colleagues. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, long-term empty homes uh, that are being ac actively marketed for sale are exempt from the council tax surcharge. Uh, but some local authorities have expressed concerns over how this is being monitored and the cost implications. Do either of you have concerns on that particular issue? Um, the, it's, it's correct that until if, if, a, if a, an empty home has been actively marketed for sale or, or let, you only implement the double charge after 24 months as opposed to after the, the, the 12 months. Um, in terms of validating whether a property is being actively marketed for sale or let, we've been f taking a quite a straightforward approach to that, making sure that we have copies of the home report uh, and can see that it is being advertised um, on a website or, or, or through actual physical adverts and newspapers and, and so on. We, we have had one or two cases where um, people have set claim they've been advertised uh, with a notice in a village shop, and that's been the extent of it, and we have, we have not uh, uh, agreed that that was sufficient. Um, but that's been... We've only ha literally had one case of that. Uh, we've not actually found it to be a difficult matter, and we haven't gone to the extent of sending out uh, empty homes officers specifically to inspect the properties or discuss with the tenant with the owners. Uh, although our empty homes officer is in uh, regular contact with uh, home empty home owners who are experiencing difficulty in selling the properties, and, and she's working closely with them. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mearson. Well, we've only implemented the 100% surcharge from the 1st of April this year, so uh, we've currently identified 72 properties that come into this category, and we've written to them to find out what their attentions are. But we will then continue to monitor the situation on an ongoing basis. Thank you for that. I'm going to up open out the session now, and the first colleague to ask questions will be Gavin, to be followed by John. Kavira, thank you. Good morning to you. Um, when the legislation was first proposed, there appeared to me to be two policy aims. One was to reduce the number of empty properties, and the second was to raise revenue. If we look at non-domestic rates only first, would it be fair to say that it has, from your council's point of view, raised revenue? Uh, it is correct that it has raised uh revenue uh, because we, we can measure specifically the increase of, of which we've charged in addition to what we would otherwise have charged. Um, that revenue doesn't come directly to the council, of course it goes into the national, national pool. Um, but we have also seen a reduction in the number of empty properties uh, over the period as, as well. So I think it has been successful in both those fronts. Yes, I just have to say, although okay. not to a greater extent, but it certainly has that impact. Okay, so it's raised revenue. In, in terms of the number, sticking with uh, non-domestic rates still, in terms of the number of empty properties, um, what sort of impact has it had and 
is there, de is there a definite causal link between the legislation and the reduction in, in empty properties as opposed to, say, the economy more widely um, within I, your council area? I, I can give you the numbers. In, in sure. 2013 14, we had 157. Uh, empty properties and in 2014-15 up to, to just a, a couple of weeks ago we had 119 so that was quite a significant reduction. Um, the, the amount of, of, of the additional charge hasn't changed uh, that much. It went from 184,000 to 161,000. Um, but I can't say there's a definite causal link. Um, the economy in our area has been improving over that period, uh, and therefore it's difficult to, 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 to be sure. Likewise, we've had a reduction of 35 properties overall, but, I mean, as I say, again, we agree that there is, there is no apparent link. We know of areas where there have been regeneration, and we also know of the issue I've already mentioned with the high streets. Okay, thank you. Uh, grateful for that. One of the initiatives brought in at the same time was called Fresh Start, uh, which was where you, if you brought an empty property back into use, there would be a reduction in rates. What impact has Fresh Start had in your uh, council area? Uh, it's been minimal in our in, in our council area. Um, I'm afraid I haven't brought the figures with me, but it's it's been just a, a handful of properties. Yes, likewise. Okay, you, you don't have the figures with you. I mean, do, do you have them? Is it something you could supply to the committee? And easily. E easily? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, likewise. and that, that would, personally, that would be quite helpful um, going forward. Okay. Um, the convener asked you about speculative and regeneration activity, and I, I think both of you said it was, you hadn't noticed anything. Um, but I was interested also, you said it, it's quite difficult to track, um, which I suspect it probably is. How, how have you, how has your council attempted to track it or is your sort of conclusion that it, there hasn't been any difference based on gut feel or hunch or is there, is there something you're specifically tracking? Um, our economic development unit do track uh, start-up businesses through Business Gateway uh, and, and that uh, leads through to additional occupation uh, of rateable properties. Um, but we, we don't really track the reasons why people go into those properties in any systematic way. Yes, absolutely saying we liaise with our business gateway people, but we don't actually monitor individual properties in detail. Okay, thank you. Um, in both of you were asked the question, what is, it, what is the cost to public sector bodies in terms of the um, changes? Argyll and Butte have said £80,000, um, but can I just be clear, is that £80,000 over the two years as opposed to £80,000 per annum? That's correct, that yeah. was over the two years. Um, in 2013-14 uh, it was just under 44000 and in 14-15 it was just under 37000 so there was a, 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 a reduction between the two years. And in, in terms of, of percentage, um, it was 24% uh, in both years of the total uh, extra cost uh, through the, um, the change in the, in the charging mechanism. Okay, and Highland, you've said in your submission £73,000, but again, is that over two years or is that per annum? No, that's over the two years, so it two equates years. to 21 properties that we have. Okay, thank you. And just, just to be clear, in terms of just... In terms of work out the cost on public sector bodies though those the 80,000 and the 73,000 that's purely for your council or associated bodies as it were as opposed to all public sector bodies located within your council area no that for for our guy and butte that included all the public sector bodies that we were able to identify in fact it was just three it was hands and islands enterprise the nhs and our guy and butte council so so for either our butte includes mm -hmm. every every public sector yes. one you can identify okay mm -hmm. and for highland likewise it likewise. includes police and uh, so if highland and island enterprise for example yes. had had an empty property that would be included in yes. your okay all right thank you uh, pop up shots recovered okay if we go on to um, uh, council tax now, or domestic properties, as opposed to NDR. Uh, convener asked most of the questions I wanted to ask, but I just wanted to come back to the collection rate a bit, just to make sure that I've, I've got this right. I think you both suggested that the collection rate had been adversely affected, at least marginally. But in terms of the actual revenue brought in, is, is am I correct in thinking the overall revenue has increased, but in pure percentage terms, the actual rate has dropped 
by you know, whatever a few basis points or whatever. That, that's absolutely correct. Uh, in, in absolute terms, uh, we have collected over half a million pounds extra income that we would not otherwise have done because we've collected 80% of the, uh, the, the additional double charge. Okay. Would that be this? Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, obviously, we've only increased by 10%, but we've still taken increased income of the region of 210,000. I, I, I should clarify that I have, I ref my figures refer only to the, the double charge, not to the reduction in discount. Sure, we okay. reduced the, the discount back in 2005 at the earliest okay, so possible opportunity, and there was about £1.7 million pounds per annum yeah. uh, additional income through that okay. each year. And we have our collection rate was not impacted through, uh, through that activity at all. It was only when we introduced the, uh, the, the double charge that we found an impact on the collections. Okay. And last question, just again, quite technical, but just I want to get to the bottom of the, the collection rate issue. Is the, has the collection rate dropped marginally because a few more people are saying, you know, this charge is outrageous, we're not paying it? Or has the collection rate reduced because it's the same properties not paying, but because they're due to pay more... It would, you know, it appears that it's not been collected, even though it's exactly the same properties. Or has there been an increase in the sort of number of properties or people refusing to pay? Um, I'm, I'm not certain on on that because we hadn't tracked uh, those particular properties separately in previous years. Um, I, I suspect that those properties were always bad payers, uh, and of course, the doubling of the charge doubles the problem. Um, so we know that at least 0.2% um, has been added to the to, um, but it may be as much as 0.4%. Yeah. Okay, but you're not aware. So you haven't tracked it all. But are are you personally aware of any people saying we're not paying now because it's double the charge, or, or are you aware of any? Uh, we, we have had a number of appeals against okay. the imposition of the of the double charge on the grounds that people feel that it's unfair generally. Uh, rather than you know, not against the, the legislation. Sure. And some of those uh, have gone as far as Valuation Appeals Committee. Uh, and in fact, we, we lost one uh, because the committee felt that, our, that the policy was too hard, uh, too harsh, even though it, it complied exactly with the legislation and with the, the way the council had chosen to implement it. Okay. Anything to add from, from a Highland no. perspective? No, likewise, although we haven't monitored individual properties, the feeling would be that it would be just an increase from the non-payers, the regular non-payers. Sure. We haven't. We've only recently issued the letters to say that the 100% surcharge would start from 1st of April, which we got very little of no response. It was only when we issued the annual bills that we started to see an influx of appeals. I think to date we've had 12, um, which we're dealing with, obviously. Okay, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Deputy Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, as I understand it, on council tax, your two councils have taken a slightly different approach um, in timing. A uh, Argyll and Butte, it says, uh, implements a policy to double the charge of council tax on unoccupied properties from 1st April 2014, and Hy uh, Highland, it's a uh, from 1st April 13, remove the 10% discount, and from 1st April 15 increase the charge to 200%. Could you, could you just give us a little background as to the thinking behind that? Because I, I realise that all the other councils have all done slightly different things as well. Yes. Uh, is this, for, for Argyll and Butte, we were very keen to implement the change as soon as was practically possible because our councillors had been uh, lobbying for this change to be made in, in the first place. However, we, we took a year um, from the change in the definition of the second home uh, so we could update our records to make sure that we had pre precise uh, numbers who, who met the, the, the new classification of the second home and also that we could give good advance warning to the people who were likely to be affected. So, so um, early in 2013-14, uh, we took the decision that we were likely to implement it uh, as soon as possible. We took the actual decision in, in August that year, uh, and then we spent a lot of time reviewing the accuracy of the council tax records. First of all, as I said, we, we reviewed the second homes to make sure they met the new classification. Uh, and then we, we reviewed other classifications of properties um, particularly ones where the, the subject address and the contact address were different, but they hadn't 
uh, been de they hadn't declared that they were empty in any way to us. They hadn't had uh, an, an under occupancy, a non occupancy discount at all. But we suspected that there was nobody actually resident there. So we reviewed all those properties as well. Um, so that then by about November of the year, we had a definitive list of the ones who were likely to be affected by the bringing in the council tax, the double council tax charge. Uh, and so we were able to contact each of them individually to give them the advance warning and also to, to make sure that they were able to, to tell us in good time whether they met the requirements of the actively marketing for sale or let before the, the double council tax charge came in on that following 1st of April 2014. So, the, the, so we took that whole year really to, to do preparatory work and prepare people uh, and to make sure that they were given the contact details of the council's empty homes officer so they could work with them to remove their properties as many as possible from the, from, from the, 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 the catchment of the, of the, the double charge. Um, we saw over that time period quite a change in classifications of the numbers of the properties. Um, the, the, the council also put a considerable amount of money uh, aside to assist uh, empty homeowners, both through loans and grants. We put three million pounds from the Strategic Housing Fund uh, into this pot to 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 provide some sort of carrot to them to do something positive with their properties. Um, and, and that was a very important part because the, the, the policy implementation in our area was really about bringing homes back into use, not nearly so much about raising additional money. That's a, a, a welcome byproduct, but it is a byproduct. The, we, we've positioned the policy in terms of reducing the, the number of empty homes and, and making more affordable properties available to local residents and um, bringing them back into use. Can I just ask you on that then? I mean, do you think Argyll and Butte is what unique in Scotland or just certainly at the high end of having? that problem? We have a, a very large number of second homes uh, and long-term empty homes together. So overall, it's over 10% it's over of our total properties. And we are really unique in having that level. I think Highland are probably next to, to us in, in percentage terms. Um, so that, that's huge and has a big impact on our communities. Uh, and, and so that, this was a big issue for us. That's great. So, I mean, the, the kind of theme from what I get from you is you wanted to do it as soon as possible, but you gave people the sufficient time to kind of work out the practicalities. Can you tell us about Highland, how you're... No, it was, it, it was very, in fact, it, probably exactly the same, except we extended it over the two years. The idea, obviously, was to introduce the policy from 13 to bring the discount down. I think the difficulty I think both councils have is the rural... The, the extents of our rural areas, it's identifying whether they are second homes, whether they are long-term empties, and just making sure that the databases are correct and affording people the opportunity, which we've worked over. And obviously, when we brought the policy back, it was then to extend it to the 100% from this year. OK. I mean, do you think we're looking at this too soon? Because it seems to me that you're both in the process and other councils are also in the process of this cha changing over in some cases, a number of years. Uh, I mean, do you think, when will we get a better picture, do you think, and things will settle down? Because it's very hard to look at one year on its own. I mean, should we go back to it maybe in five years, or what would you say? Sorry. I certainly think that it's too early for us to gauge because we will obviously only see the impact of the 100% from this ongoing year. So the impact to, for us to date has been minimal. But I think this change will allow us to reflect so possibly a few more years before we can see the full extent. I think the position for ourselves is now much more stable. Uh, I, I, I'm expecting that um, year on year going forwards to see a slight reduction in the numbers uh, of, of long-term empty homes as more and more are brought back into use. Um, so I'm probably ex I'm anticipating about a 10% reduction year on year. Um, but that's still a, an educated guess based on the number of, of properties our empty homes officer typically brings back into use, which is around 60 each year. OK, thank you. Um, I th yes, it was in yours, uh, Ms. Orr, that uh, you said some of the registered social landlords had been a bit unhappy about the changes. Uh, can you tell us <laughs> how unhappy? <laughs> Um, well, our largest, we, we've had housing stock transfer, so the council doesn't own any, any council houses anymore. Uh, so our largest um, registered social landlord who, who uh, received the bulk of those houses, the additional cost to them has been £20,000 for the, this first financial year. Um, and it, it probably will go up from that because they have quite a large number of properties uh, which are currently void um, that they're finding particularly difficult to let in particular areas. 
Yes, I'm interested in that because I mean I. I I've, I mean, in my constituency, we've got quite a lot of housing associations, and some are very good at reletting, and some are not. But I realise it's not just down to the housing association; it's also down to where the properties are and things. Are there particular problems in your area about some houses, more remote yes, ones, perhaps? Yes, and it's very much down to particular areas where there is a, an oversupply in, in, in the market, uh, and there, and also private sector landlords have been bringing down their rental prices. Very normally they're much higher than the, than the social land um, rented sector, but we've noticed in these particularly hard to let areas, some of them have been bringing them down to sort of nil uh, let nil rents um, just so to get somebody in them to pay the council tax. Uh, that has been the exception, but it's been heavily reported in our local press. But we we have basically two areas: it's it's as it parts of Campbelltown and, and parts of Rossi, which are particularly problematic. Right. Would that be true in Highland as well, or are you short of housing everywhere? Well, there are certain areas. There, it, it's, the correlation is exactly the same. Um, so you would have some areas where yes. the landlord is having problems letting? Yes. Right. Okay. And I think just the final thing I wanted to ask about was a, if you've got any evidence of like avoidance and people doing artificial things. You kind of hinted at that when it's no rent, just to get the council tax paid. I mean, the, the suggestion was certainly in some business areas that a small business was being given much more property than they actually wanted just so that the landlord could say it wasn't a uh, empty or vacant is that an unusual situation or do you think there's signs of that happening we haven't seen much evidence in the in the non-domestic area but in the domestic area um i am concerned that there is that um quite a lot of potential to say a property is a second home uh and it, it for it actually not to be uh, for it to be long term empty uh, and because of the rural nature, we haven't employed a, a large number of, of officers to go out and do inspections of these. We have taken what people have told us as valid. Um, but I, you know, certainly anecdotally, I know of some instances where properties are boarded up and yet we've been told that they're second homes um, and it just can't be the case. So that's an area for going forward where we're going to put some more resource into. But initially, we, we wanted to take a, a fairly soft approach on that. But we, we do know there is avoidance. Same in Highland? No, because we, as I say, we haven't moved to the 100% surcharge yet, so we haven't seen any particular problem with the council tax. The difficulty, as we reported, was in the NDR, we're starting to see this pattern whereby shops are you know, occupied for three, four months, then move out, a new shop will kick in, and there's suggestions that they're doing it rent-free, and it really is just to avoid the 90% charge. And the patterns are forming where it's the same properties. It's difficult for you to pin down what, who's liable or who's the owner? or The, the nature of uh, non-domestic rates charging is by the time we, we get it to, into a recovery situation, the owner, has, well, the occupier has moved on and it's really tracing them then. OK, that's great. Thanks very much. OK, um, Richard was going to ask a question uh, on that specific issue, but he's not going to ask it because you've just answered it in effect. Um, here to be no other uh, questions from colleagues around the table. Is there any other points you would like to make to committee? Um, not for myself, thank you. No, no, okay. Well, we'd like to thank you very much for the evidence you've given to committee this morning. Thank you. Just suspend for uh, five minutes to get the new, the next uh, little witnesses in.
I shall um, reconvene uh, the session. Uh, our next item of business today is to take evidence from Scottish Government officials on the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Bill's financial memorandum. I therefore like to welcome to the meeting uh, Neil uh, Rennick, Anne Oxley and Kat Duggan. So good morning to you uh, this morning. Uh, members have copies of the financial memorandum as, as well as all written evidence received. So we will go straight to questions and of course you'll, you'll know the drill. I'll ask some opening questions and I'll open it the session to uh, colleagues uh, round the table. First thing I, I would uh, I would uh, ask about is a consultation. I understand that the certainly Aberdeenshire Council have suggested that the consultation window was relatively short. Was there a specific reason for that? There, uh, there, there wasn't formal consultation uh, on the bill. The, the position that we, we took as set out in the policy memorandum is that there there had been. Uh, extensive dialogue and a number of, uh, of reports undertaken looking at the issue of, uh, of human trafficking both for adults and uh, and victims and that we drew heavily on those, that work both by the, um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, by the Commissioner for Children and Young People uh, and by um, the Committee of this Parliament as, as well. So we took account of that in reflecting the, uh, the, the, the detail of the, the bill. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think one of the things which everyone seems to agree, and it's obviously it's a fair point, but at the same time, it must be frustrating from your perspective, is with regard to the comment and the overall accuracy of the projected cost, because it is obviously a criminal activity. It's it's covert. Um, it, you know, if it's successful, costs could go up. If it's not successful, it might they might not go up because you don't arrest people. People aren't tried, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that all being said, uh, you know, there's quite a wide uh, margin in terms of the, uh, you know, the kind of projected costs. Is that because you've tried to, um, you know, take the absolute minimum that you think this bill will cost and the absolute maximum, or do you think that the costs could go beyond the parameters that have been suggested in the financial memorandum? Um, we acknowledge, and we acknowledge in the financial memorandum, and acknowledge today that uh, this is a, a hugely difficult thing to make estimates about. It's a hidden crime by its very nature. We we know that there are people who uh, are currently identified and are referred through the, the the national referral mechanism and are, are confirmed as trafficking victims. We know from agencies that there are people that they are in contact with who, uh, as adults, don't wish to engage with that process, but there's uh, a strong belief that they are trafficking victims. And we can be reasonably confident that there are uh, far larger numbers of people who we, we don't identify and don't come into contact with who, who may well be trafficking uh, victims, but may be receiving support in, uh, in other ways in due course. Uh, and just with the hidden nature of the crime, uh, there is no way of confirming an absolute figure for that. We've looked at the, the uh, National Crime Agency, which does a strategic assessment of the, the, the levels of, uh, of trafficking across the, the UK, or an estimate drawing on not just the number of referrals, but intelligence information and advice from agencies. Their estimate across the UK is that the, the true number of, of victims uh, is something like two to three times the numbers that are referred through the national referral mechanism, and we've used that as our, our best estimate of what the numbers would be in, in Scotland. Okay, thanks for that. Now, the significant grant um, support uh, for the victims of trafficking, uh, and I think that's acknowledged, but a number of uh, local authorities, North Ayrshire Council, my own area, South Lancashire Council also, have talked about uh, subsequent additional pressures going on to social work, for example. North Ayrshire Council said additional pressures may occur within social work assessments associated with investigations uh, or prosecutions. And um, uh, uh, South Lanarkshire Council have also talked about uh, the impact, for example, uh, on social work, education and housing. I'm just wondering if you, if you feel that the financial memorandum is really taking enough of a long-term view in terms of the potential impact on local authorities that, uh, you know, that, uh, that the bill may have. I mean, we recognise that there are um, the, the way in which the, the current arrangements uh, already work for people is that where someone is identified as a, a potential victim of, of human trafficking, they have a, a right to a, a, a period of support to allow them to adjust from their experience of trafficking and take decisions about what their long term uh, needs and, uh, and life choices will, will be. And we as a Scottish Government currently provide funding for that, that period of uh, immediate support. At the moment, that's set at a minimum of 45 days. That was increased from a, uh, the, the earlier level. Uh, and we fund that through for adults through direct grant funding 
uh, from the, the Scottish <coughs> Government. Clearly, once people move beyond that period, part of the function of that is to allow them to take decisions about their uh, long-term future and ensure that they can access into mainstream services just as anyone else can access into mainstream services. It's important to note that a, a significant majority of the people who are identified as victims of trafficking uh, come from out with the, uh, the, the, the European community and are therefore subject to uh, asylum and immigration arrangements uh, and therefore would be subject to support arrangements uh, organised by the UK uh, government, including support arrangements that are funded to, to local authorities. So actually the vast majority of people who are currently identified as trafficking victims will get support in that route. There are separate arrangements in terms of, uh, of children, uh, and which, uh, which Kat can, can describe. Yeah, uh, the situation in relation is somewhat different because uh, local authorities are already under duty to provide services to children uh, of this nature under uh, the Children's Scotland Act 1995. Um, we don't expect that, that there'll be more trafficked children in Scotland because of this act. We do think there's a lot of children who are accessing services currently um, who may not have been identified as being trafficked, but they will still be um, receiving and in receipt of services for a different form of abuse. We do believe that the awareness and training um, that will come as a result of this, this act means that um, frontline services will be better able to identify these children as being trafficked and give them a perhaps different form of uh, advice and counselling, etc. Yes, I mean, North East Council have talked about the fact they're actually doing training already to be able to um, uh, recognise uh, victims uh, of trafficking exploitation, and they don't believe that that will have a, a, a financial burden uh, on them. In, in terms of the Scottish Court Service, actually, they, they have got really just uh, uh, concerns about the one-off costs of about £12,000 to um, amend the criminal case uh, management system to allow it to record statutory aggravators for offences connected with human trafficking. But they also curiously, or certainly I found it curious, they, they said that, uh, that um, and I quote, if responsibility was to lie with the SES for forfeited aircraft and ships, then we'd require to procure a service which would provide for the transport, storage and disposal of these items. I mean, now likely do you think there's going to be a, a, any forfeited um, you know, uh, vessels and aircraft and ships and all that? Is that something you don't think is likely to happen? Or if, if it was, how would the, that matter be addressed? The, the bill does allow for additional powers. It's important to separate out the, the two elements to this. There's one around the, the immediate seizure of um, vehicles, uh, ships and, uh, and small aircraft that uh, the, the bill will allow the, the, the police to, to under, uh, undertake. Uh, that's so that they can immediately stop trafficking uh, happening or the risk of further trafficking happening. There are separate provisions under existing uh, proceeds of crime legislation that allow for the, the, the seizure of um, uh, vehicles and aircraft uh, and so on, but that's under existing legislation that happens, all, uh, that, that happens already. Again, we're not <coughs> expecting huge numbers of uh, uh, additional seizures in, in, in that way, but there are existing uh, arrangements to cover that. Okay, I'm going to let uh, colleagues in in a minute or two. I'm just, uh, just one further point. Uh, between 2012 and 2013, the number of potential identified victims across the UK identified through the NCA Strategic Assessment and NRM increased by 22% and 41% respectively, but the bill's looking at about 10% of an increase year on year. Is there any reason why that 10% figure has been um, uh, you know, um, chosen, given that the, the, the numbers seem to be increasing? Um, we've, um, we've been looking at both the, the NCA figures and the, uh, the National Referral Mechanism figures for, uh, for Scotland. The NCA figures, uh, only the, the, the most recent figures, provide separate information for, uh, for Scotland, whereas the National Referral Mechanisms have a, a run at least back to 2012. The numbers we see for the National Referral Mechanism have gone up from 96 in 2012 to 99 in 2013 to 111 uh, in 2014. So, and that's with the input of uh, Police Scotland putting a lot of effort into to this area, uh, undertaking more training of officers and also the NHS and others training being provided there into local government. So we are seeing uh, an increase in the numbers of people being referred, but it's not a, it, it's not a huge step increases. It's it's a steady increase. 
for the uh, for the, the the NCA, the figures for Scotland were slightly unusual. For the rest of the UK, we saw um, uh, higher estimates compared to the NRM once intelligence and other factors were drawn in. For Scotland, it actually came back uh, lower once we took out people who weren't confirmed as victims and duplicate cases. So we're, we're trying to understand why that was the the, the case. But on the basis of the uh, the NRM figures, we're confident that the, the numbers will continue to go up over the next few years. And we think 10% uh, is a, a reasonable estimate based on the input, the, the work that we'll put in. We're not expecting that to have an immediate uh, result in increased uh, identification. So you don't think there'll be a deterrent effect of this kind of legislation if there's going to be an increase kind of year on year? Or? I mean, the hope is in the long run that uh, that, that we will have a, 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 a deterrent effect. If I was being honest, I, I suspect there's still quite a, a significant pool of people who we're not identifying that we still need to identify before we can be confident that we're seeing a, a genuine turndown in the, the numbers of people being trafficked. But you're absolutely right, that would certainly be the aim, is to actually deter people who are, uh, are trafficking. And a number of the measures in the bill try and achieve that, the, the, the risk orders and control orders that are in there. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much for that. Sorry, Cap, you were going to add something? No. Okay, it's just that Neil looked at you um, <laughs> as if as if you were. Um, okay, I'm going to open out the session now. Um, uh, to colleagues, the uh, first uh, person to ask a question will be John, to be followed by Gavin. Hey, thanks, Convener. I mean, just to press you a little further on the what local authorities might face, um, you know, I'm kind of thinking, well, A, if the legislation is going to be tighter, perhaps we are going to find more uh, victims, young victims, who the council would presumably then have to take into care, and that comes at quite a cost. And presumably, if we're imprisoning more adults, they, they have their own children who would then perhaps have to be taken into care. So I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, is there not a, a possibility that we have a considerable number of younger people that do need uh, to be taken into care? I'll answer the question on the, 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 the prisons and the, the numbers of people that like can't answer them. In reality, what actually happens is that there's 22 children and young people who, who were referred for the National Referral Mechanism in 2013. The numbers for 2014 are 25 children, even in, including what the National Crime Agency has said. That's two to three times more um, than that. Children who... Anecdotally, it has come back. We've done quite a lot of work with local authorities on this and health boards as well. And they've said that a lot of children have come forward who they they haven't they present as being victims of one form of abuse or as being vulnerable and in need of care anyway and they would have been taken into care and perhaps been seen as a looked after child and it's only later through the process that they'd become um, known as victims of trafficking and I think this will this will be exactly the same situations we see here so there won't be a massive upturn there won't be lots of children who are and young people who are coming in from nowhere that that are presenting as victims of trafficking just a better understanding that the children who are in the system may have been trafficked before i mean that's the point i was really wondering about because are the, so we're saying basically that we think we're in touch with all the kids uh, and as as you say some of them we find out more about them as as they're uh, we go through the system I was kind of imagining, but I mean, I'm, I've not been involved in the bill uh, itself, really, but there, there are kids out there that we are not aware of that are in houses or whatever, um, and that by tightening up the legislation, these kids might become apparent, but that's not really the expectation. There may be some, but I think it would be a, a small number that, that would be talking about in that. I think we go back to the first point, which everybody has made, that is it's a, it's a very complex issue, and a lot of it is hidden, so we don't really know, but... With all the evidence that we're getting and anecdotally from local authorities and, and services who work directly with children and young people on these specific issues are that, that it would be a very small number who would be these, these children that, that would be not known to services at all. Okay, thank you. In terms of the, uh, the criminal justice system and the numbers of people going through the, the, the courts, um, we know in advice from the, the Lord Advocate that um, there are very small numbers of people who have been successfully prosecuted under the, the existing uh, specific human trafficking offences that, uh, that exist. Uh, I think four is the maximum in any, uh, any year in 2013. But uh, what the Lord Advocate has advised is that there are... Um, uh, 
other people who they believe uh, the, the offences were committed in a trafficking background, they're not able to prove the, the trafficking element of it, but they are able to prove other offences such as immigration offences or money laundering or brothel keeping offences, and they will prosecute them through uh, those offences. Uh, so those people will already be going through the court system and already be going to, uh, to, to prison, but just not with the, the label of human trafficking. Part of the, the aim of the bill is both to strengthen the, the, and clarify the, the trafficking offence, but also to introduce uh, trafficking aggravators, which will mean that where someone's prosecuted for one of those other offences, and there's reasonable evidence that there's a trafficking background, that that aggravator can be applied so that we can see that uh, those are cases with a trafficking background as, uh, as well. Equally, of course, there may well be people who we are not currently identifying, and we'd, we'd hope that uh, we can identify those and have them being prosecuted. Okay, thank you. And, and another point, just from a different angle, I mean, when we put somebody in prison, I see the figures £42,500, uh, which presumably includes the cost of building the thing and paying the interest and the governor and all these kind of things. So, I mean, if you put one more person in prison, it doesn't actually cost £42,500, does it? Right, that's just the. Uh, I mean, we use that as the, the the unit cost basis on which to make that. But you're absolutely right. It's it's really when you you start having to. It's you have to look in the round in terms of what the overall impact on the prison population is, and when you start passing the thresholds of needing uh, new accommodation, so that the numbers involved in human trafficking are are very small and would be in the normal margins of the uh, the change around in terms of the the prison population on a day to day basis. So. Right. Because I'm not saying we should do this, but I mean, if you did look at the marginal cost of what is the extra cost of one extra prisoner in a prison, presumably it's, it's, it's very, very little. Yes, the cost of your first prisoner in your prison is extremely expensive, and then it goes down as yes, you, you, you add more people in. So, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult thing to try, and, and obviously something we do in, in a lot of the, the uh, criminal justice legislation is to try and uh, reflect that. But um, we, we try not to underestimate it equally or, or overestimate it, but we recognise it's not an exact, uh, an exact science. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gavin. Not much, uh, too much else left to ask from my side, um, but just a couple of questions. If we go to the financial memorandum, the, the back page of that memorandum, uh, you have paragraph 60, and just underneath that you've got table 7, which is, I guess, a collection of, of most of the costs. Um, bottom right-hand corner, total cost in year 4, uh, between 775000 and £1.928 million. Um, so I'm right in thinking then, you're, based on, the, on what the work you've done, the, the likely maximum cost as a consequence of this bill by year four would be just over 1.9 million. Uh, yes, that's uh, that, that's right. Although, as, uh, as Mr. Mason has pointed out, obviously we, that that would include the the full costs of the you know the, the largest part of those costs relate to uh, the the prison service and to a lesser extent the the court. So we don't think in reality so, the full costs would be at, the, at that level. So, uh, so it could well be lower than it that. Could, yeah. Certainly, we, we would expect it to be uh, to be at the lower end rather than the upper end. But we, we've included the range sure. to try and reflect. That. Okay, then that's helpful. Um, I mean, the convener asked about a deterrent effect and. Presumably, the policy objective and your and your hope over time is that this does have a deterrent effect. But I guess the the unknown is at, at what point and what, to what degree is it a deterrent effect? But have you basically in your figures have you basically assumed a deterrent effect of nil? And so, if there is a deterrent effect, then there's a you know it's a financial bonus as such, uh, as well as obviously a, a good full stop. But in terms, your working assumption is yeah. that there's no deterrent effect. And um, the. In, in broad terms, yes, that's, that's right. We haven't assumed that we will see a, a turnaround in the sort of timescales that we're talking about in the financial memorandum of a small number of years. And as I said, I, I, my, my uh, suspicion from the, on the basis of the, the, the various reports that have been done is that the, there may well be uh, a number of victims who we're not identifying and so that, that we, need, we still need to take account of that. The, the one area where we have um, looked at was in terms of the, the introduction of, uh, of specialist risk orders for people who've already been prosecuted or identified as potential traffickers, where we're, we're introducing new risk orders to control their actions. And part of that is to deter them undertaking uh, further human trafficking activity. Uh, and um, certainly down south, the assumption was in, in the, when they were introducing similar provisions that that would offer a significant financial benefit 
benefit in terms of not having to proceed either with um, criminal cases uh, or with the, the other action around that. We've not assumed any savings in that way, but we've just assumed it would be cost neutral. Okay. But it, but it is it's perfectly possible by the time you get to year five or year six and so on that actually the 1.9 drops to... 1.7 and 1, you know, it's, it's perfectly possible that in terms of the trajectory, instead of an, a, a guaranteed upwards trajectory, over time it becomes uh, a falling trajectory. That's certainly our hope, okay. yes. Okay. And just a, this is the last issue again, just, I mean, again, it has been touched on, but I just want to, to clarify. It's, um, I guess it starts at pa paragraph 39 of the financial memorandum, part three. Uh, confiscation of property. I just want to. I just. I guess I want to check the, the government approach to this because the government approach seems to be that there'll be no additional costs, and it doesn't really. I guess talk about any additional benefits either. But presumably, in in practice, there are bound to be some additional costs, especially if. I mean, while uh, the, well, the convener suggested it was unlikely, if there was, for example, a boat involved, for example, in the order, there would be a cost attached to that. But if, if ultimately that property is confiscated uh, and can be sold off under proceeds of crime, then actually there's an income as well. So you, I guess you've taken the approach that there will be neither a cost nor an income. Um, I guess was that a policy decision or, is, or are there other ways of looking at it? And th this particular element is focused on a, a fairly narrow time frame. It's in that immediate period when someone is is first uh, first arrested uh, and before they've been formally prosecuted. It's to allow the the, um, the the police to take immediate action if someone is using a vehicle for the purposes of trafficking to uh, to deter that trafficking by seizing control of that vehicle. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are, there are separate arrangements that apply once someone has been through the court process uh, and uh, and been subject to conviction. Then there are existing arrangements that deal when there's actually a a, a, a formal forfeiture of the the, the vehicle uh, or boat. Yeah. Okay. No. So I, I tell you that. Yeah. So just I mean it, maybe this is an, an impossible question to answer then, but in in, in broad terms, let's say uh, there is a a boat just for the sake of argument. In terms of the costs of, of seizing it and, and holding it and storing it versus the cost of then being able to sell it, do, do these things tend to just work out broadly fiscally neutral or, or overall uh, does, does, you know, does the government generally end up slightly better financially or slightly worse? I mean, I know it's a very general question, but is, is there a general rule of thumb? We don't tend to separate out the, the individual elements of proceeds of, sure. uh, of crime uh, income. Uh, we, we get a, a total figure for, for, for that. So overall, uh, we, we gain a, a benefit from under proceeds of crime, and that money is used by the government to, to, to invest back in, uh, into communities uh, through various uh, schemes. So yes, there is an overall uh, benefit relative to the costs. Sure. Okay, that's all. That's all. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you very much. Uh, Jean's been followed by Malcolm. I mean, it's a, a kind of general question, I think. But, um, <clears throat> earlier on in, in the evidence you were giving, you were talking about people, and we all assume human trafficking out with the EU because people are free to to come here. But uh, I think there is some knowledge, at least, of uh, bogus agencies who set themselves up as employment agencies in some Eastern European countries and in fact do treat people almost in the equivalent way that is described here in terms of, of modern slavery or human trafficking. And I wonder if there's a, a, a rather, I, I think it's similar to the bogus colleges that were set up uh, to bring foreign students in, and I, I think there was an investigation into that, but is that something that is is taken into any, uh, in into the kind of financial implications of, of how we investigate um, employment agencies that, that are, uh, to say the least, dubious in their ambitions for finding work for people from Poland and Slovakia and so on. Anna will correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but the, 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 the bill does include provisions uh, and the existing legislation also includes provisions that allow for uh, extraterritorial uh, application of the, the law so if there are people who are committing com crimes uh, abroad but are living here in Scotland or are, uh, are here in Scotland there's a scope for, for prosecution of those and is there anything else on, on that? No, but what you said is correct. 
in reading the evidence, I suppose that, uh, the strongest evidence, I thought the, the, the biggest range of concerns came from COSLA, although they were reflecting some of the other, the individual local authority submissions as well. So uh, there's various sections that they deal with. But starting with protection of victims, I mean, I suppose you've answered already in relation to child victims of trafficking, although, I, I mean, COSLA do suggest that, you know, a key point of the bill is to increase awareness and identification of victims. So I, I suppose there, there might be some scepticism about the idea that there won't be any increased numbers at all. Uh, but they also make points about internal trafficking and also the possibility of appointing guardians, or is that against policy to appoint guardians? It, <clears throat> it depends what definition of guardian is used. Um, and there's been, uh, from the evidence I've read that, that has come before, committees in this, it, it, it can vary quite a lot. We do have the Scottish Guardianship Service, which the Scottish Government does fund. Um, they look at unaccompanied asylum-seeking children. That doesn't necessarily have to be trafficked children, although some of them do have indicators of being trafficked as well, and this is an organisation which we are re reviewing at the moment in, in terms of funding. Um, and they, they do an excellent job of providing advice to children who are who come in out with the UK, um, uh, particularly out with the EU, actually, in relation to understanding their immigration rights and giving, putting them at the centre of the process as opposed to putting the immigration process at the centre and them having to fit around it. Um, so our position in relation to the Guardians is that it, with unaccompanied asylum seekers, we, we will look at our, our work with the Scottish Guardianship Service and uh, going forward when we're reviewing them later this year as well. In terms of adults there, in a kind of way they're saying, well, um, these services are provided through dedicated providers, Tara and Migrant Help, and, um, but they then go on to talk about a significant number of potential victims who don't engage with the national referral mechanism and, are, and therefore, COSLA are keen to confirm that the potential victim of human trafficking does not, if they don't consent to a referral to the uh, NRM, the processes in pl are in place for Tara and Migrant Help to provide um, emergency funding to cover accommodation, etc. cetera. And, and is that, sorry, I, I don't really know in detail how this works, but is that a, a funding for you or is that UK government funding? In, in, terms, of, of, uh, in terms of adults, um, then, uh, for adults who, who are referred through the, the national ref referral mechanism, the, the purpose of the national referral mechanism uh, is actually a, a route into to services and to, to government funded services. So uh, any adults that are referred through that, uh, that process uh, and are then confirmed as, as trafficking victims have uh, automatic rights to, to support that is funded by, uh, for people in Scotland, is funded by the, the, the Scottish Government. That's the current arrangement and that will continue under the, the, the new legislation that we will continue to, uh, to pay for them. Uh, where people aren't identified as, uh, uh, where people don't wish to take part in the NRM or are not identified as trafficking victims, clearly they aren't part of that, that, that same arrangement and they'll be subject to other arrangements if they're, they're, they're non-EA nationals, if they'll be subject to the asylum and immigration system that's funded centrally by the, the UK government. Uh, if they're, other, if they're uh, other than that, then they'll just be uh, like anyone else that they can access into mainstream services. So could you reassure COSLA on that point about the funding of Tara and Migrant Help? Or? Yeah, uh, we'll continue funding. Um, we, we currently do it through Tara and Migrant Help and we'll continue funding uh, services. And uh, our assumption is uh, within the financial memorandum is that more of those people who we think are uh, genuine trafficking victims will be identified. Uh, so we've assumed an increase in our, our funding for that. Now, they also raise funding for awareness raising and training. Um, would you accept their point on that? Or? Uh, yes, uh, we, we, we do both uh, as a government and local authorities. I think as the, the, the convener mentioned earlier on, local authorities do already fund uh, training uh, on uh, recognising the signs of, uh, of human trafficking. And we worked with Police Scotland um, the year before last to, to publish a, an information leaflet to try and raise awareness. And we've included within the, the financial memorandum uh, an assumption that we would uh, carry on funding additional training and awareness raising activities as part of the, the, the human trafficking and exploitation strategy that we'll prepare.
you also say, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say in relation to children as well, the Scottish Government published a toolkit last year, which is for frontline practitioners, and it's about who engage with children and young people, and it's about identifying um, victims, potential victims of trafficking as well. We've also included it as part of our national guidance, which we refreshed in 2014. Uh, and following this committee meeting today, I'm going to meet with Child Protection Committee chairs in a meeting that's been set up for quite a while, which is, and that's also having a trafficking element in it, looking at how they're all responding to things locally and what we can do at a national level too with it. They also say clarification is required with, with regard to the costs and arrangements for managing and overseeing any trafficking and exploitation orders within a local authority. I suppose it's the cost that we would be concerned about. Uh, yes, uh, and, and the, the main part of the cost of that would fall on uh, Police, uh, Police Scotland in terms of monitoring those. But obviously that has to be offset against the, the cost of not having to investigate and prosecute uh, trafficking offences because we will be uh, controlling and stopping the preventing uh, those people from undertaking those offences. And finally, we're well, right at the beginning under the offences section, um, they're talking about additional pressures on existing local government services such as social work assessments. And then also local authorities could incur costs in supporting any individuals that have a specific physical or mental health condition. Um, um, do, you, do you accept any other points on, on that and have they been taken on board? We'll certainly keep a uh, we'll certainly keep a watch on the the uh, what happens with the uh, the both the the new offence and the aggravators to see what the kind of scale of increase the numbers uh, as I said earlier are extremely small in terms of the numbers of people who are currently uh, prosecuted, but the, our advice from the the Lord Advocate is that they are prosecuting people for other offences. So we think a, a, a reasonable proportion of the the people who might be additional human trafficking offences will actually be people who are already being prosecuted under other offences. And um, that will be one of the, the key, uh, our key aims is to keep a, a monitoring of that. And if there are extra costs in local authorities, then we'll, we'll obviously discuss that with COSLA. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bob. Uh, Mayor, just very briefly, Malcolm has covered some of the points I was, I, I was hoping to raise. And it's actually in relation to part four of the bill, as, as Mr Chisholm mentioned, about trafficking, exploitation, profession and risk orders. Um, so just looking at the bill, it's two new civil and associated interim orders to assist in preventing trafficking and exploitation, trafficking and exploitation prevention orders, TIPOs, and trafficking and exploitation risk orders, TEROs. So that's the terminology. And I've read thread through the financial memorandum and that and about costs and savings. But then, of course, when a TIPO or a TERO is, is, is granted, the monitoring process falls to, to Police Scotland. Um, and, it, and I heard what you said to Mr Chisholm about, you know, there, there's benefits about... Um, not having to investigate in certain cases as well. C can I ask you, has there been anticipation of how many TIPOs and TEROs are, are, are likely to be issued in, say, the first five years? Um, we think the numbers will be very small based on the number of prosecutions at the moment, even if we were uh, assuming that we managed to, to double the, the maximum number of prosecutions in, in any one year. We'd still only be talking about um, eight, uh, you know, roughly eight people. So the numbers will be very small compared to uh, the, the activity that Police Scotland undertakes. Uh, yeah, per year? Per year, yeah. Eight, eight per year. Um, ha has there been discussions with Police Scotland over what the level of monitoring would be, because eight people doesn't sound a lot given the, the significant resources that Police Scotland has, but it all depends on the level of monitoring yeah. that, that, that you, you put in place. Uh, that, that's correct, and also it will depend on whether these are people that, for uh, other offences, they're already engaged with in monitoring for, for, for other reasons. For example, um, obviously organised crime or, uh, or issues associated with, uh, with prostitution and brothel keeping. So that was part of the dialogue that we had with Police Scotland, is really giving them the powers uh, in terms of people that they're already aware of and in contact with. Just in terms, and I don't want to get too hung up on the numbers, but it's financial memorandum, I suppose we should get a little bit hung up on, on the numbers. Um, eight per year, maybe, I get these are these have to be guesstimates by the very nature of of, of the legislation and the criminality that, that that is trying to be exposed here. Are we thinking half of those people will already be under the monitoring of, of police for, via investigations, or all of them, or, I mean... What, what do you think? I, I worry the Finance Committee is encouraging me to, uh, to, to make guesstimates uh, on all of this, but the, um, uh, in the dialogue with Police Scotland, they were comfortable that these were powers that would be uh, helpful to them, that the numbers would be uh, relatively small, and that uh, 
they would be people that they, they, they would probably be already in, in contact with. As I said earlier, the thing that we haven't done um, is make an assumption that there will be a significant saving from uh, not prosecuting people, but clearly that would be, that's the intention of TIPOs and TEROs, is that you're not having to pay the costs of investigating trafficking crimes and prosecuting people through the court. So it's it's really a balancing off that you'd rather put the, uh, the work up front to save you having to do the investigation and court activity further down the line. Okay, and, and I know Police Scotland are, are content with this. I, I don't want to drift on to policy matters as, as the financial memorandum, but, for example, in relation to monitoring of sex offenders within the community, there's a debate about how extensive that monitoring should be. Should it be a multi-agency approach? Is it really just Police Scotland we're talking about in relation to monitoring these these individuals that, as you see, might be involved in a, a variety of, 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 of other crimes? But we're not talking about EU specialist unit. We're talking about teams within Police Scotland that are already active in a day in out basis involved in in these matters yes that, that's correct and that's okay. something that i would give uh, significant credit to police scotland okay. that uh, very quickly after they were established they put in place um, a, a national team and specialist local officers in dealing with human trafficking to make sure that uh, that uh, as a country we were dealing more effectively with this crime so those resources are already in in place and monitoring uh, and monitoring these activities that's helpful. If Police Scotland are content, I suppose the level of monitoring then comes down to a kind of policy rather than a financial memorandum um, position. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. That appears to have exhausted all the questions from the committee. Are there any further points that the bill team would like to um, make to committee this morning? Thank you for uh, the time. Well, thank you very much for answering your questions so comprehensively. Thank you. Um, that being the end of our public session uh, today and having agreed to take the next item in private, I'd like to close the public part of the meeting uh, for a couple of minutes to allow the official report, witnesses and uh, the public to leave. <laughs>